Well, welcome again, everyone. Uh, Dr. Michael Scharf is the O.W. Rollins Orkin Endowed Chair in Urban Entomology and Molecular Physiology at Purdue University. He entered Purdue in 1986 as a freshman in agriculture and subsequently earned his B.S., M.S., and Ph.D. degrees from Purdue University in 1991, 1993, and 1997. After graduation, uh, Dr. Scharf spent time at the University of Nebraska and Cornell University as a postdoc in the University of Florida where he was a tenured professor for several years. In 2010, uh, Mike returned to Purdue and uh, his primary research interests at Purdue relate to understanding biochemical and physiological mechanisms in insects that have practical implications for pest management. Well, welcome, Dr. Scharf. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, it's really nice to be here today, and I definitely appreciate the invite to uh, share some of this uh, information with the urban pest management industry. So today I'll be talking about um, just some of the basics of insecticide classification and mode of action for pest management professionals. And, you know, I'll acknowledge right at the outset that this is probably not something that's on everybody's radar screen out there in the industry. And just one of my goals in this presentation is just to help, even if, you know, no matter what your experience level is with pesticides, to just to help raise your, anyone's level of understanding for, for how these things work. And so, um, so my goal is in this presentation is just to, you know, just this one overarching goal, and that's to improve general knowledge of how insecticides work. You know, so if you're dealing with a, a product, you know, you can ask yourself, um, you know, does this product target the nervous system of the insect? And if so, in, in what way does it target it? You know, just maybe you can try to understand that a little better. Um, or, you know, does the product work in a completely different way, like an insect growth regulator? So that would be very different than an insecticide that would target the nervous system. And I'll, these are things I'll get into in a little more depth as, as I go through this talk. Um, and so, but knowing how these insecticides tool, how these insecticide tools that we have available, you know, how they actually work, you know, this is essential knowledge for the industry. Um, and, and so why is that? And so um, here's just a list of things, and these are themes that will come back through the talk, um, but just to kind of introduce them here, and then they'll be reinforced later. Um, you know, the first is just uh, safety. So, um, you know, um, some insecticide modes of action have lower non-target toxicity than others. So they, they, they affect insects more than they do mammals, you know, humans or mammals. and so. Is the safety factor. Um, um, understanding how insecticides work can help with interpretation of advertising and trade literature, which isn't always um, technically accurate, so um, it's good to have a little extra knowledge so you can in interpret that trade literature. Um, pollinator health is really huge uh, right now. You know, it's, it's becoming something that we, we all need to know about in the industry and how to protect pollinators especially with products like uh, nicotinoids that actually, um, you know, they move around in plants. And so if you're, you're doing a lawn application, for example, um, you know, the, the plants, flowering plants in the, in the yard or the landscape can take up those nicotinoids and that can affect pollinators. Um, resistance management is a really big factor. Um, you know, knowing how to, to rotate products is, is really important and, and do other things that can help um, you know, get around the resistance problem. Um, product sustainability, you know, in the industry, we're stewards of, of uh, you know, we represent the manufacturers as well as the pest management industry. And um, you need to understand that every product, every insecticide product that makes it to the market, that costs hundreds of millions of dollars, if not more, billions of dollars to get to the market. And so, um, you know, using products wisely so they have the longest market life is just, it's good business sense for, for the whole industry. Um, understanding how insecticides work can help design customized pesticide applications for, you know, um, uh, and that goes along with 
uh, situational pest management. So you know, designing customized applications with the right products for the right situation. So understanding how insecticides work and how they're formulated really comes into play with, with uh, situational pest management. And then the last one here is just um, you know, communicating with your customers and explain to them how product work, products work, but being able to do it in a, in a way that communicates competence, that shows that you really understand what you're doing, and you're going to be safe, and you're going to protect pollinators, and et cetera, et cetera. And so, um, you know, all these things are really important, I feel, and, and they all go together. And so, the, and that's my motivation for putting together this particular talk that I'm going to be giving here. Um, which I've given now several times over the last five years, and um, despite the technical nature of the, the information, I do get a lot of positive feedback on it. So hopefully everyone will feel the same today. Um, so here's a, an outline of what I'll be presenting. Um, I'll you know just get in some, I just covered some background and in, in, uh, introductory information. Um, if we wanna know how insecticides work, we need to talk about some of the basics of insect physiology because that's how insecticides work. They, they disrupt the physiological function of the organism that they're targeting. And that's what, you know, that's how they work. That's how they cause uh, deleterious effects in those target organisms. Um, I'll talk about some basics of insecticides and the, and the modes of action and then um, talk about, uh, break them up into two different groups, the, the neurotoxic insecticides and then the non-neurotoxic insecticides. And then I'll finish with some more of this practical knowledge like like the situational pest management kind of information. So kind of bringing things to concepts together and talking about factors that affect how well insecticides work. So um, even if you don't follow along with everything in excruciating detail, and it's all very new to you, um, the information that I'm presenting today, there are two additional sources of information. And the first is uh, an article published in 2011 um, called Insecticide Primer um, and Insecticide Mode of Action. This appeared in PCT Magazine. Um, this was authored by myself and Dan Souter. And, um, so there's some good um, supporting information to what I'll be presenting today. And then over here on the right, there's the, this um, publication that probably Dan and I, uh, we co-authored that we probably need to revise it soon. It's almost 10 years old now, Insecticide Basics for the Pest Management Professional. And this is available free of charge at this website shown at the bottom, um, universe, sponsored by the University of Georgia. And uh, I'll put these up at the end too, in case you don't have time to to write down this information here. But, so there's additional information out there that will uh, perfectly go along with the information I'm presenting here today. So starting with uh, insect physiology and just giving like a really brief overview. Um, so if you were a, an entomology student like we have here in our department at Purdue University, so you would take a whole semester course on insect physiology and biochemistry and I'm not going to cover that whole course today, but I've just com compressed it down into a, um, a couple of slides here. And there are just some critical physiological components of insects that, that is good to know about. And, um, and I'll explain why here in the coming slides, but these are the, the cuticle, you know, the outer covering of the insect, the nervous system, which is, you know, basically what controls what's going on in the insects and control, same thing happens in mammals and, you know, any animal has a nervous system that controls what's going on in the body. Um, muscles, of course, control movement and that's, those muscles are controlled by the nervous system. Um, the digestive system is, you know, that's where things happen, um, you know, with nutrition and food that's ingested in the insect. And this, there's this really important idea that you know, the inside of the digestive tract is actually the outside of, of an organism. So it's kind of like we have this um, tube going down the middle of us that's actually outside of our bodies, which is, and, it, and that's a barrier to, di uh, 
ingested insecticides. We'll talk about that too. And the respiratory system is really important as well. Um, you know, when we're talking about, for example, fumigant insecticides, right? That's how fumigants actually make it into the insect through the respiratory system. So just talking about some of these features in more detail, so I've just shown them here, um, just kind of run through them one by one. First is the nervous system. And so in every insect, you know, they have, the nervous system runs along there. They have a brain and this ganglion that controls their mouth parts and then this ventral nerve cord that runs along the ventral, the bottom side of their body. That's, that's the central nervous system of the insect. And then there are all these peripheral nerves that come out and go throughout the body. So the, all, our, all our neurotoxic insecticides that we have, you know, they're targeting the nervous system throughout the body, like we see here. Um, the insect cuticle um, is made up of, it's a really, it's actually very complex, and it's made up of a lot of different layers. And so if we think about insect growth regulators, and you know, so they're disrupting the formation of the cuticle, and that can have really, um, pronounced consequences on the insect when we just disrupt the subtle nature of the cuticle. The cuticle is also important because it's a barrier to insecticides. So, you know, any contact insecticides that an insect is, picks up in the environment, they have to make it through all these layers of the cuticle in order to get to the inside where the nervous system is. Um, here's a, over here is the gut. So this is a really nice picture from my lab of a termite gut. And you can see it's a pretty complex kind of thing. Um, and again, here's this, you know, this tube that goes down the middle of the gut, which is actually the outside of the, the, the organism. It's, you know, it's exterior. So, for example, insecticides that would be ingested, you know, they're, they have to penetrate through these barriers of the gut to make it into the body to affect their target sites. So, you know, the gut is really complex. Um, I'm jumping over here to the tracheal system. So, you know, within insects, they're, they're a bit different than, than humans and an, other animals in that, you know, the tracheal system is this series of tubes, physical tubes that run through the whole body that bring air from the outside and deliver it to the inside of, of all the cells within an insect. Right? That's different than, than animals and mammals like us, for example. You know, we, we have lungs, you know, we breathe in the oxygen, we have gas exchange happening in our lungs, we have hemoglobin that carries all the oxygen around in our bodies. That's very different than, than what's actually happening in insects. Insects has the, this physical plumbing kind of system with all their trachea. And then finally down here we have muscles. And so muscles are, you know, what control movement and responses to stimuli and, and all of these kinds of things. And so, you know, within the insect they have really complex uh, really complex muscular system, much like our own, um, and it's controlled by the nervous system, of course. And, and we have some new insecticides that um, affect the insect um, calcium channels in their muscles. And this is a really important new mode of action that we have available that's actually very safe. It's very insect specific. And this would be insecticides like, um, like chlorantranilopril or cyantranilopril, right? Really, those words just roll off your tongue, don't they? But those are the, those are insecticides that um, affect the insect muscles, and they're very insect specific. So, it's good to know a little bit about musculature as well. When we talk about this topic. So, um, so moving on from insect physiology, I next want to move over to um, insecticides and just some some very basic concepts, and then kind of moving towards modes of action, which it gets a little more complex as we go on. But I promise not to, you know, get too technical. At least I'll try not to with this. It's a very technical topic, so it's, it's hard not to get um, too caught up in the, the technical details. But, so just thinking about insecticide classification first, um, so, you know, insecticides, they have, they have chemical structures that allow them to be um, uh, classified. So we can think about, you know, like if we think about all the different insect groups, right, they have different kinds of morphology, different forms that allow them to be 
um, um, classified in the different groups of um, the different taxonomic groups of the insects, like termites and roaches and flies and you know all the different groups. So here we just have some insecticides listed. Um, there won't be a quiz over this, but you can see if you just look at their structures, they look very different. They're made up of different um, elements, you know, different atoms make them up, and uh, these different structures are what give them different functions and allow them to target different target sites, which I'll talk about next. But this idea of, um, you know, insecticide class, target site in the insect, and then the mode of action at that target site, those are all highly interconnected uh, concepts. So, and it all comes back to the chemistry, unfortunately. Right? Chemistry can be a really intimidating topic, but um, it, it all comes back to that. So I'm not going to get into that too much, though, as much as I love structures. So talking more about uh, target site and mode of action, so we can think about mode of action as almost like it's a, like a target site and mode of action. It's like a key in a lock kind of scenario. So, you know, the insecticide has a very specific structure that allows it to interact with a very specific target site in the insect. So it's like a key in a lock. You know, only that chemical is going to fit in that target site. And then, you know, you imagine the lock would open, and that's like, um, you know, the, the toxicity happening in the insect. You're disrupting the function of that physiological target site. And target sites are their actual locations or physiological locations within the insects. And so, and this is what I'll, I'll kind of run through the different insecticide classes here coming up in the next part of this talk and point out the different physiological locations associated with, e with each. Of course, I talked about this lock and the key analogy, but in reality, um, what people who, people who study insecticide mode of action and design new insecticides, they're thinking in terms of what you see down here at the bottom. You know, the target site, it's a protein, usually, within the insect. It's got three-dimensional structure, like, like the, you know, the lock, and the insecticides, actually, chemical structures can dock up with that target and, you know, disrupt it. So, it's actually not as, it's way more complex than the key in the lock, but, um, Thanks to modern science, we can predict these things very well. And it's actually very similar to drug discovery and drug design as well. So really, um, the drug field and the insecticide field have a lot of overlap, believe it or not. But bringing it back to just these four very basic modes of action of the insecticides, right? So target sites are physiological location. Modes of action are the actions of insecticides at those target sites. And we can really break it down into four modes of action. There are only you know, four kinds that occur. So that would be stimulation or blockage, um, especially with nerves. So if you stimulate a nerve, you cause it to fire more rapidly. And if you block it, you basically shut it off. You keep it from firing. So we have pesticides that do both those things. Um, we have other things that are they're called modulators, like pyrethroids. If you know anything about pyrethroid insecticides, they're modulators. So they're binding their target site and just kind of modulating its shape, changing <clears throat> the subtle ways that it functions by, by modulating its, its shape. And then the last one here is inhibition. So we have a lot of insecticides that actually inhibit certain enzymes in the nervous system, like acetylcholinesterase enzymes, which we may all know about. Um, are the target sites of organophosphates and carbamates, which I'll talk about too. But we have these just these very four basic kinds of modes of action, and it's um, it's very simple actually. So when I'm teaching my toxicology class at Purdue University, this is just how I kind of lay it out, and and it's um, it's very easy to understand um, these concepts when you just recognize that there are only four ways that target sites can be disrupted, but that's all I will say about that, because try not to get too technical here. So um, there's another concept, which is um, um, the concept of the LD50. And so LD50 is the lethal dose that would kill 50% of your test 
insect that you're looking at. So every insecticide has a different LD50 um, that's unique to that insecticide. So you know, not all different do different insecticides have different dose ranges at which they're effective. And that's just the very nature of the chemistry and the physiology that's going on. So in general, we can say that the relationship between product toxicity and LD50 is inverse. So the smaller the LD50, the higher the toxicity of a product. That means, so if an LD50 is small, that means that you only need a small dose to kill half of your test population, and, or all of it. It just, these insecticides are active at um, the smaller dose um, equals greater toxicity. Um, insecticides that are more toxic or hazardous have lower LD50s. Again, that's just reinforcing what I just said. Um, and insecticides that we have today are actually much more toxic to insects and, and pests than they are to people and pets. You know, some by over 10,000 times. So that's really amazing if you think about it that, you know, thanks to modern science and advances in technology and human understanding, uh, we're able to design insecticides today that are, um, you know, um, some are actually completely uh, safe for mammals. And I'll, I'll point out some of these as the talk goes on. But we have insecticide classes like the diamides, which don't have a signal word, if you can imagine that. So they have, their mammalian toxicity is so low that they are not required to have a, have a signal word. Although that doesn't mean that we shouldn't practice safety with them. Um, uh, another idea that's connected to this is that only very small amounts of insecticide that are placed in the environment of you know, the pest actually reach their target site to cause toxicity. So the ratio is like, you know, billions to one, maybe even higher than that of the actual amount of insecticide that goes out in the environment to what is contacted by the insect and travels through its body to reach the target site and have an effect, you know, it's only a billion or less of what's actually placed out there. And a, lab, a lot of that goes along with the insecticides just being so pest specific. So I think we're moving in a really good direction um, as, a, as a whole in terms of being able to have safer products today. Um, with, with, they have high mammalian LD50s and low um, insect LD50s. So. Uh, moving, moving on then to the different insecticide um, classifications and by mode of action and, and the different chemistry groups. So um, we have insecticides that target the nervous system, and there are five major classifications here that I'll, I'll talk about. And then we have insecticides that do not target the nervous system. So if, if you're think, just thinking about very broad classifications out there, um, you know, we can break them down into things that target the nervous system and things that do not target the nervous system. And I'll talk about five categories here in the first, five classifications of neurotoxins, and then four classifications of um, products that are not neurotoxins. So moving on the first topic of things that are, are neurotoxins, talk a little bit about the insect nervous system. And these are, so the insect nervous system is made up of millions of nerve cells. So it's, you know, it's pretty amazing when you think about it. And these are some, some images from, you know, my, one of my favorite textbooks uh, from Chapman, uh, The Insect Structure and Function. So I learned a lot from this book as a student a few years ago. Um, but you think about nerve cells, this is kind of what they look like. And I don't really need to talk about what's, you know, the different classifications of them, but um, you know, individual nerve cells are what make up the whole nervous system like we see over here on the right. And so it's, it's pretty amazing when you think about, so like, you know, hold your arm out and snap your finger and think about the signal traveling through your whole nervous system, how fast that happens from your brain to the muscles in your finger. And then, you know, you heard the snap of your finger, that information traveled back from your ears to your brain. You know, the, the nervous system moves uh, at amazing speeds. Things happen incredibly fast. It's, it's you know, it's mind-boggling to think about. 
So we have all these cells, nerve cells, um, in the nervous system that you know um, are affected by insecticides. They also control the function of the nervous system in a really integrated kind of way. So how does the nervous system actually work? Um, again, without try not to get too technical here because this is not a neurobiology course, but we can say that information travels through the nervous system in the form of electrical impulses. Right, so these impulses are moving at the speed of light, basically. Right? Think about that analogy of snapping your fingers and that signal moving at the speed of light you know, down a neuron. So this is electrical energy moving down a nerve cell. And then, so remember, the nervous system is composed of millions of cells, and there are gaps between these cells called synapses. So that's what this would be here in the middle, this gap between two neurons. And so the electrical information, when it reaches the end of a nerve cell, then uh, it becomes chemical information in the form of a neurotransmitter that will cross that gap. Um, and those neurotransmitters bind a receptor on the other side. And those are very specific to the different kinds of neurotransmitters. And then instantly, you know, at the speed of light, that becomes electrical information, again, moving down the next neuron. So we have impulses that move in the form of electricity um, through nerves, and then those impulses cross gaps in the form of chemical messengers called neurotransmitters, and those neurotransmitters bind receptors that carry the information to the next neuron. And again, this is all happening at the speed of light. So, pretty fascinating. So, um, you know, in, in my lab, we, we study insecticides effects on the insect nervous system. And so, you know, how do we do that? We, we use a, a neurophysiology system, which is pretty um, fun and uh, informative. You can do really good science with this kind of approach. Um, and so here's an example of, this is a, an American cockroach that's been dissected open by one of my students who has really good hands, the hands of a surgeon, as we, we joke and say. Um, and you can see right here, this is the ventral nerve cord of the, the American cockroach. And all these little squiggly lines here, those are the trachea I mentioned. That's the, those are the breathing tubes. You can't really see the nerve, but it's, it's right down here in the middle. And we can stick an electrode onto that neuron and then that nerve cord and measure the electrical activity doing that. So this is an example of kind of like baseline activity. This is five minutes of recording. This is just the nerve kind of, you know, the insect obviously is dissected open and the nerves firing away for five minutes. And then if you apply an insecticide like fipronil, um, so fipronil causes neuro excitation. And you can see here's an example then of what happens to the nerve after that. It's, it's firing at a much more rapid rate and with a, a higher uh, magnitude of intensity. So. Um, it, and so we can, you can look at the nerves and you can see these effects very clearly with neurotoxins, with, with, which is, um, you, know, you can see what is happening. So it's, it's really informative and I think this kind of graphic really helps to, to bring it home and show some of the physiology that's going on. Um, so, so moving along to insecticides that, uh, insecticide target sites in the nervous system. Um, so I'm going to talk about these and the insecticides that affect them. So sodium channels, chloride channels, acetylcholine receptors, the acetylcholinesterase enzyme, and then I'll talk about combination products that target multiple locations at once. So we have a lot more combination products available to us now. And so it's good to understand how they work in collaboration. So um, so the, here are some of the target sites in the nervous system, and uh, I don't want to get into this too much. This is a little bit technical, but this, the next couple of slides I throw up here, those are going to be a, available in some of the, the supplementary material that I, I showed you at the beginning of the talk, and I'll, I'll mention it again at the end. But these are just, this is just, a, I'm trying to show here where the different target sites are on neurons. And so we have uh, chloride channels here, which are at the, they occur after the synapse right here. So 
the GABA receptor and the glutamate receptor are actually chloride channels. Uh, here's the acetylcholine receptor. Um, it's actually a sodium channel. Uh, let's sodium into neurons. Not to be confused with these other things called sodium channels. You realize that can be really confusing. But it's, so these sodium channels that are on the axon of the nerve, you know, the long skinny part of it, um, these are the actual on switch for a nerve cell. So pyrethroids target these sodium channels. Um, here's a, again, here's a synapse. The acetylcholine receptor is here. Here's acetylcholinesterase, which is a neurotransmitter that will cross that synapse and bind um, the, um, the acetylcholine receptor. And um, over here, then, you can imagine this would be a muscle that would be controlled by these nerves. And we have calcium channels that control muscle contraction that are targeted. Those are the targets of the diamide insecticides that I'll be talking about, too. So all these different, I guess the main point here is that these different physiological target sites appear on different locations of the nerves. Right? They're doing different things for the natural function of the nerves. So the insecticides, when they disrupt them, they'll have different effects that we can see. Um, and again, this is just a more maybe too technical information. The top part is the previous slide showing the different, um, different channels, chloride, sodium, et cetera, acetylcholine. And these down here in the bottom, these are the insecticides that are affecting these different locations. So phenylpyrazoles like fipronil affect chloride channels. Abramectins affect glutamate uh, chloride channels. Neonicotinoids and spinosins uh, affect the acetylcholine receptor. Pyrethrins and pyrethroids and um, indoxicarb uh, affect these ax axon sodium channels. Um, diamides affect muscular calcium channels, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'll get into these in more detail, but this is just kind of a, a roadmap showing you the different physiological locations of the target sites and then the insecticide classes that affect them. And again, you can, um, you can reference this inf information um, in some of the handouts that I'll, I'll, I'll show at the end. So first off is the, the actual sodium channel insecticides that I want to talk about here. So these sodium channels, again, they're on the axon of the nerve. So they're on this long, skinny part of the nerve. And they're really the on switch for the neuron. You know, when they, when they open, nerve impulses move in the form of electricity are moving down the, the, the nerve. So, we, and we have pyrethroids and also DDT and pyrethrins are in this category too. They stimulate the sodium channels and cause excitation. So they'll cause that nerve to fire, which causes the insect to Right. I'm sure everybody has seen insects, for example, treated with pyrethrins. They, you know, they get knocked down right away. So that's their, um, that's that incoordination of their nervous system caused by that hyper excitation from their sodium channels being stimulated. Um, we have oxidiazines. So this is indoxicarb, you know, really uh, big urban insecticides that we have. They affect uh, indoxicarb affects the sodium channel, but it blocks it. So it, works in a completely different way, causes inhibition, and then the insect is actually paralyzed because its sodium channels don't work. You know, the on switch is stuck in the off position, basically. We also have a new, newer insecticide called metaflumazone, which is a semi-carbazone. Um, this could be, uh, I know there are ectoparasite uses for this, this product and possibly some other urban product uses as well. It also blocks sodium channels. So we can at sodium channels, we can stimulate them or block them, depending on the different insecticide chemistries. Moving along to chloride channels. Um, so chloride channels are um, located um, along the neuron, and they cause chloride to flow into neurons, which actually mellows them out. So chloride has a negative charge, and that kind of brings down the activity of the neuron under natural conditions. But we have in our, you know, one of our biggest insecticides in the urban market is fipronil. Um, everybody knows that, I'm sure. It's not actually off patent now. There's some, a lot of consumer products uh, that have fipronil in them as well now. Um, fipronil blocks the chloride channel, 
so you're blocking this mellowing effect, which leads to excitation. And you remember that nerve recording picture I showed you? You can see, like we can apply fipronil, and very quickly we can see the excitation happening in, in uh, the nervous system from that. So um, we also have the isoxazolines. This is a new word for me. Um, this new class of insecticides has a lot of um, antiparasitic uh, uses, especially on pet products. Names here are Furolaner and Sarolaner. So this could be really big in the flea market, these products. It's good to know because you know, vets are prescribing these things. They're out there in probably really good quantities and they compete with Fipronil so that we can see some cross resistance issues between these two. So um, something to pot to keep an eye on. These are still really new products, but um, something to, to think about. Again, those cause excitation. We also have the avermectins like abamectin, um, you know, like a really good gel bait active ingredient that we have currently. Um, uh, abamectin stimulates the chloride channels, which leads to inhibition. So that actually paralyzes the insect. It has the opposite effect of what fipronil would have, even though they're both affecting the same target site, basically. They just do it in opposite ways. Um, moving along to acetylcholine receptor insecticides. So remember here we have one neuron uh, with an electrical impulse tap traveling along it. We have a synapse here and then we have another downstream neuron as we would say in the in the business. And so here's a, and here's the synapse. So acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter that crosses that synapse to bind its receptor on the next neuron. And so we have our mainly the nicotinoids, that's, you know, the huge market share right now of these products, they're affecting the acetylcholine receptor by stimulating it and causing kind of excitation in the insect. Um, and so um, and we also have a new class called the sulfoxymes or sulfoxiflor. It's a new product you may be seeing, acts at the same target site, and probably spinosins, maybe for those working in the landscape market, have heard of uh, spinosad, and, um, and it, it basically affects the acetylcholine receptor in the same way. Um, we also have the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, so they're acting to inhibit acetylcholine, and that's the organophosphates and the carbamates, which we probably, anybody who's been in the industry a long time knows these products really well. Um, they inhibit acetylcholinesterase, and that causes excitation. This is not a really insect specific target site. You know, these things work equally well against humans and mammals, and so we have a lot of restrictions on these kinds of products for a good reason. Um, so, next, moving along to the combination products. So, I think it's really important to talk about these, so I've thrown them in here. All of our combination products that we have, they start, all start with T. I'm not going to name them here because I get confused really quickly because I'm sure that's part of the logic in naming them all with T. Um, but they combine nicotinoids and pyrethroids. And so, um, and they cause this effect called potentiation, which is actually hitting two target sites at once. So you get this synergy, this one plus one equals three kind of effect. So again, the nicotines target the acetylcholine receptor and then the pyrethroids that are in these combo products affect the sodium channels. So affecting two target sites at once gives this um, added kind of effect. So these products generally work, I think, but you know, just like anything, they're, they're um, not immune to having resistance in the pest to them. Important to keep in mind. So, so that was the, I talked about things that targeted the nervous system there. Now I want to quickly go through things that affect target sites outside the nervous system. And so uh, these are the muscular calcium channels. Talk about insect growth regulators here, um, inhibitors of energy production, and then the, the cuticle dehydrating dusts last. So hopefully everybody is following along with that. If, um, if I'm going too quickly, I'll take a little pause here and maybe we can uh, I'll just Take a little breather, and uh, maybe if anybody has any questions, you could let, let Dan know those through the, the chat box, or 
but otherwise I'll, I'll just try to keep forging ahead here and, and keep us on track. So again, moving on to insecticides that act outside the nervous system. So the first one here is the, the uh, muscular calcium channels. And so again, this is where, so we have a nerve that's meeting up with a muscle. So it's a, mu you know, a muscle that's controlled by a nerve. They are, they're all controlled by nerves. And we have these neuromuscular calcium channels that occur right at these locations. And when calcium comes out of them, that causes muscles to contract. So it's that simple. Calcium equals muscle contraction. And so these, the products we have here are the diamides. So we have chlorantranilopril and now cyantranilopril, and probably there are others on the way too. What these things do is they stimulate the neuromuscular calcium channel and that causes that muscle to contract for a, you know, a few hours and then it burns up all its energy and then it's inhibited and the insect just kind of is kind of laying there in a paralyzed state for a few days until you know, it's, all its energy is burned up and it eventually dies, sadly. And so, um, so the, um, these products are actually so safe for mammals that no signal words were required by the EPA initially. Now the manufacturers did a really smart thing in this case and said, no, we're going to give them a, a caution signal word still, which I think is very wise. Um, but these products are pretty safe. Um, but that doesn't mean you should not follow safety um, guidelines when using them as well. So that's the muscular calcium channel toxins. And um, talking next about insect growth regulators. So. Um, you know, insects, as we all know, they have outer exoskeletons and they undergo metamorphosis. And we have different kinds of um, um, development that insects go through. You know, they have the ametabolist development where the, where the uh, older insects look just like the younger ones, except they're just bigger. We have incomplete metamorphosis and hemimetabolous insects like grasshoppers and roaches and termites, where the the really, the only difference between adults and juveniles is that adults have wings and um, they're reproductively competent, and the juveniles are not. And then we have complete metamorphosis, like in mosquitoes and flies and caterpillars and those kinds of things, where you know the immatures are larvae that don't really look anything like the adult. And so, my point in showing these is there, there's a lot of intricate changes that are going on in the insect cuticle as they move through development, and that's all controlled by hormones and chitin synthesis enzymes that synthesize the chitin in the exoskeleton. Um, so, you know, insect development is really intricate, and so as, as an insect's going from egg to adult, there are all these different hormones that are changing their, their concentrations in the insect, and um, uh, you know, and that's what's controlling, and there, some are occurring together and some are occurring alone, um, and that's what controls these really subtle changes. And then eventually they molt, and this is a really nice set of photos of a, a alate termite that has just emerged by one of my former students, and you can see, like, you know, they emerge, and they have to expand their wings and their structures, and they have to shed their old skin effectively, and then they can become a, a normal adult eventually. They, as you know, they darken up over time too. So their cuticle gets tanned. So lots of hormones here acting in concert that can be disrupted for insect control purposes. And that's where the insect growth regulators come into play. We have uh, you know the juvenile hormone analogs and the chitin synthesis inhibitors. Those are the two big ones that we have in the ur urban market. Juvenile hormone analogs, they mimic juvenile hormone. And this leads to cuticle deformation and actually extra juvenile stages, which, you know, if you have juveniles that can't mate, that can cause the population to crash. So that's part of the strategy there. With IGRs like pyroproxifen, for example, we see, you can see this wing twist happening in insects as they, like cockroaches especially, as they move through development. So if you go into a new account and you see individuals with wing twist, you can you know, put good money down on the fact that IGRs are in that population affecting it. So you may not want to use them continuously with thinking of potential resistance issues. It might be okay to use a different product when you see wing twist in the population. Um, chitin synthesis inhibitors, 
they inhibit the enzyme that causes uh, the cuticle to form in the insect um, as it's going through the molting process. And chitin synthesis inhibitors can lead to death during molting. Some of the effects like you can see in termites treated with chitin synthesis inhibitors is they show this jackknife effect even well after they're done molting. And this is from their cuticle being malformed. So that's how those things work. And uh, inhibitors of energy production, uh, a lot of products here. I don't want to get into them too much. Um, but these things all target the mitochondria, which that's like the energy plant in all cells of all organisms, plants, animals, insects, whatever, fish, bacteria. You know, everybody's got mitochondria. And there's this thing called respiration happening here and different kinds of toxins are affecting different parts of the respiratory chain, um, as we call it. And I don't want to get into that in too much detail because there's a lot of different things going on here. But some of the products you may be familiar with are hydromethylon, you know, cockroach, it's a cockroach bait, uh, chlorphenopyr, that's like, uh, you know, a, a good product that we have. It's got a food label. It's pretty safe. Um, fumigants like sulfuryl fluoride um, and others, methyl bromide, um, they um, inhibit mitochondria um, and wood treatments like disodium octoborate tetrahydrate, DSOBTH, that actually um, can affect uh, insect respiration. And boric acid is very similar, also affects insect respiration by disrupting this process. Although there's evidence also that boric acid can be abrasive, uh, be like a desiccant and disrupt the actual gut lining. Um, so those are the inhibitors of energy production. And lastly, so congratulations, we've, we've made it to the last mode of action here. Uh, we have the cuticle dehydrating dusts. And it's pretty simple what they do. Here we have silica gel and diatomaceous earth, which are just basically finely ground glass powder. And those, you know, so on the outside of the insect surface, there's this really fine, waxy, oily layer um, that helps protect the insect from water loss, basically. And, and so these things, you know, they abrade the cuticle, they, they break it down, which leads to water loss in the insect and, and lethargy, for example. So you just can look at them and see they're not happy after they've been exposed to these things. And we have, you know, diatomaceous earth, and which mainly contains silicon, is, you know, that's the big active ingredient here, which actually, actually comes from the ground exoskeletons of diatoms, which are um, you know, organisms that have silicon in their, their outer exoskeleton. So it's a major source for these things. So that's how the dehydrating dusts work. So I know that was really like a whirlwind tour of the different modes of action. But again, just trying to give you some basic information that you could follow up on later you know, if, you, if you really wanted to. And again, I'll, I'll put up some references at the end that you can go to. So the last part of the talk here, so kind of coming down the home stretch, um, there are several factors that affect how well insecticides work. And so, and I just broke these down into stability and persistence, um, formulations, pest behavior, sanitation, and resistance. So this is where like, you know, the toxicology of the insecticides comes into practice in these various areas. So uh, on the topic of stability and persistence, we know that so most insecticides are oily in nature, which helps them you know, cross the cuticle and membranes and reach their target sites within the insects. So you know, if we think about we put oil in water, what happens? The, they part, the two things partition into phases. Usually the oil will float on top. And that's really the same thing that happens with a lot of our insecticides. They're very oily by their very nature. But Unfortunately, in their pure raw form, you know, insecticides, not only would they be unsafe, um, but also they can degrade rapidly in UV light. So ultraviolet light can break them down and they can be lost in the environment. So even though they don't dissolve in water, they can move with water and end up, you know, going, uh, end up moving to places where you didn't apply them. So that's why we have formulations. And formulations are complex mixtures of the active ingredient 
inert ingredients and or food attractants and stabilizers in the form of baits, for example. And these things, they enhance the stability and extend the longevity of the insecticide. They enhance safety. They make the product easier to handle or mix, and they keep the active ingredient uh, dissolved in water effectively. And so some of our different formulations, which I'm sure everybody out there who you know, is actually working in the industry on a day-to-day -day basis, you know these things really uh, intricately well, intimately well. Um, we have the, our bait insecticides, granulars, dusts, aerosols, fumigants, and then liquids. Of course, you know, we have all these different forms that the insecticide will come in, like the emulsifiable concentrate, wettable powder, microencapsulated, suspension concentrate, etc., cetera, et cetera. So these are the formulations are physical um, factors, physical things that are added, that are mixed with the insecticide active ingredient to help deliver it and make it safer and dissolve in water, et cetera. So we have to have formulations to make insecticides work. Um, another really interesting thing to think about is how pest behavior can impact how insecticides work. So, and I just have three examples here, but um, I'm sure uh, people who are out there working in, in the field and observing things can, can have other things to add here. But uh, like with cockroaches, we have secondary and tertiary kill. So, you know, if, if we have a cockroach that eats a bait and it either um, excretes you know, the, some of the bait in its excrement or it's dead and another roach feeds on it or another roach eats its feces, we can have secondary kill and even tertiary kill. It's even been shown that insecticides can pass through the digestive tracts of two roaches and if a third roach eats the feces from the second roach, it can still be affected in a tertiary way. That's pretty fascinating. Um, we have flea larvae that can be exposed to insecticides um, uh, from their host, from like a dog or a cat that's treated with a product that you would get from a vet, for example. And the, the adult fleas will defecate out the insecticide and the mature fleas in the, in the bedding material will eat the feces of the adults. You know, that's how they get some of their nutrition. And so they can be secondarily affected by insecticides through their behaviors, their natural behaviors that can be exploited. Um, and then another um, factor. I'm sure Dave Oy will talk about this a little bit in the next talk. Social insects like termites and ants practice trophallaxis and aloe grooming. So, you know, they're spreading food materials from both ends, from the mouth and the anus side. They're sharing materials. They're also grooming each other. And this can be a great way for insecticides to move from individual to individual. And so typically we want slow acting insecticides in these kinds of situations in order to affect the maximum number of individuals in a population. Um, briefly here, sanitation. We all know it, you know, it's really important. Um, you know, despite today's insecticides being uh, mostly pest specific and even have very selective toxicity to insects, poor sanitation always makes them less effective. And so this is where the IPM mindset really comes into play to help make insecticides more effective. Um, you know, excess food in an account will compete with bait. You know, that's pretty logical. Um, if we can eliminate that competing food, we can get the more bait to be eaten by the pests we're trying to target. Um, clutter creates excess harborage that can't be treated. I mean, we've all been in that mega cockroach account that maybe looks like the top here where everything is moving and you certainly, you know, we can't treat all that surface. You know, legally we can't treat it. And, and so that's, that's a problem. And dirt and grease tie up insecticides too. So this is, you know, an extreme case here in the bottom, but um, you know that the insecticide is going to be less effective in that environment. Absolutely, no question. So this is where the IPM mindset comes into play with making insecticides more effective. Um, another important factor here is resistance. So this is where kind of toxicology interfaces with practice in a really big way. This is something you know I study. Maybe I'm most well known for working on insecticide resistance. Uh, I would argue that resistance is probably the number one cause of callbacks in cockroach accounts. Some of the things we've seen in recent years are just amazing. Even with baits, um, we've seen cockroaches that can 
eat bait as their only food source for a month and survive. So pretty mind-boggling. Um, you know, bed bugs, pyrethroid resistance is, is widespread. We know that. Um, uh, and, but there's also newer evidence of resistance to other active in, uh, ingredients. Not picking on chlorthenopyr here, but the potential is there for resistance to not only this active ingredient, but to nicotinoids as well as others. It's just a really big uh, problem. The pests are always adapting uh, with resistance, and we have to figure out how to stay ahead of it to have our products keep working. One way to do that is product rotation. It seems to be key for long-term success. And even with mixture products, so those mixture products that start with tea, um, that combine two active ingredients, we even need to use those in rotation, so I've learned, um, so, so we've learned. Um, this is a typical rotation scheme that we've been recommending for years for cockroaches. Um, every three months, switch active ingredients, maybe even every month if you can do it. But we've also learned that uh, it, uh, it de depends on the active ingredients you're using too. Not all active ingredients are going to be compatible and unfortunately the science is really lacking here. We hope to publish some papers soon showing how which products would work the best in, in combination, in rotations, but um, that information is still evolving, and it's something definitely I would encourage the industry to be paying attention to and asking for um, in, in the coming months and years. So, so that kind of brings me down the home stretch. Um, my summary points here are, you know, insect physiology provides unique insecticide target sites, but also creates penetration barriers. Um, I talked about five classifications of neurotoxic insecticides. So just try to keep that in mind that there are five, and you can follow up on what they are on your own time. And then with non-neurotoxic insecticides, um, there are four classifications here that we have. So you know, if you know what these nine classes are, as a technician or a technical manager, you know, you'll be able to communicate this to your customers better, and maybe communicate more competence, and also maybe be more effective in pest management. I'm sure you will be more effective. And lastly, insecticide chemistry interacts with other factors like behavior and resistance and sanitation that impact both insecticide use and efficacy. So, you know, it, again, big take-home message here, increasing your knowledge in all these areas can make you a better pest manager. I'm, I'm completely sure of it. So um, with that, I'll thank you for your attention. And I'll put up this very last slide here. This is the two additional sources of information that you can go to for um, supporting information to what I presented here today. So thanks very much. All right, very good stuff, Mike. Uh, you, you commented on resistance there at the end. I think we may have to have you back for a, <laughs> a webinar on resistance. Did you ever give a resistance webinar, Mike, in the past several years, or was, was it always mode of action? No, I did give one on bed bugs and roaches. We've got more information now, so okay. um, yeah. Well, I'll see you in Denver. I might have to hit you up on, on a something for next year. But we did have a did have a few really good questions that came in, Mike. I'll kind of go through those. I don't know if we'll have time to get to all of them, but um, had one question here on combination products. That since we're using combination products at lower doses, do we risk the potential uh, of resistance to two chemistries at once? I would say, um, even though the manufacturers don't want to hear it, I, I would say yes. Um, we've seen evidence of resistance to both active ingredients um, in, in select roach populations, roaches that are resistant to both nicotinoids and pyrethroids, and, and that affects the product performance. Mm. So yes. Is it a fair statement, Mike, that uh, just the, the development of resistance is kind of inevitable with overuse of an active ingredient. Would you is that uh, there an yep. in, in inevitability of resistance? Absolutely. Yep. Um, you know, I I I try not to pick on products um, because I think that resistance is possible to any product, mm -hmm. and we've seen it. And so, it and it's just it's all a matter of appropriate use. Um, you know, length for lengths of time and intensities of selection. So it's possible always. Yeah, that I guess that's why that 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 resistance management uh, 
uh, ideas you were talking about are so important. It really is. Yeah. Uh, I had a question here. This is my question here. Talk about the flow of new active ingredients into the pest control industry. It seems that you know, over the years, things have kind of slowed down, and the in the industry is kind of generic heavy at this point. Do you, do you see what's the what's the horizon for new active ingredients that are coming into the to the industry? Do the big manufacturers is there a do they all have active ingredients that they're working on? Will we see new actives that are coming into the market? It, well, a lot of it depends on economics, of course, but and I think all of our manufacturers have lots of things in the pipeline. It's just a matter matter of them to be able to, um, you know, get it into the market and um, have it be able to. It's got to make money, you know. The market's got to be right, and so they they're very careful about how they move things and and get them into the market. Mm -hmm. I think it's an it's an expensive process. It is yes, and we have to remember the urban slice of the pie is you know it's not as big as agriculture, and so. Um, you know, this is just where we need a voice and need to, you know, keep keep after the manufacturers to to let them know we need these things. Mm -hmm. So, had a question here about chlorantranilla problem, Mike. Um, would it have effect on non-vertebrates like earthworms? Um, that's a good question. I would suspect it probably does, but um, the way the labeling is. Um, possibly not as much. It's it's a really unique molecule molecule in terms of being super selective for even certain insect groups. So um, it's possible there's some selectivity. I just haven't mm -hmm. seen that info. Yeah. How about uh, the IRAC? You didn't mention I. Well, you did, this wasn't really a resistance talk, but can you can you mention IRAC and what that is for the mm -hmm. audience? Yeah, it's IRAC is I R A C, the Insecticide Resistance Action Committee. And that's uh, so all of our manufacturers have representatives who are part of IRAC globally, and they come up with um, different mode of, mode of action classifications that can help you decide how to rotate products. And so, um, if you Google IRAC, I don't not have their exact web um, address in front of me, but they have a really nice thing uh, that they update once or twice a year with all the different chemistries available so you can see the whole landscape of active ingredients available and you can get help there for choosing different modes of action to rotate through that's one of their main functions another question here Mike you had talked about nicotinoid insecticides um, and one of the operators was familiar with the neonics is there, a, is there a difference between the nicotinoids and the neonicotinoids I think there it's it's just terminology. Um, mm -hmm. They're pretty much so the the nicotinoids look more like nicotine, which is what they were patterned after, and then the neonicotinoids kind of they've evolved. They don't really look like nicotine anymore physically, mm -hmm. but they still affect the acetylcholine receptor. Like a clothianidin is a neonicotinoid, whereas imidacloprid is a nicotinoid. I see. So nicotine's an insecticide. Absolutely. <laughs> right. We can talk about what happened the first time we chewed tobacco or smoked a cigarette way back as teenagers. <laughs> yeah, because I can remember. I remember uh, somebody at Purdue used to chew tobacco and put it inside of a jar and then put some caterpillars in there and it would kill them. <laughs> it's it's dangerous stuff. Yeah. Let's see here. Uh, could you comment on the difference between? Uh, the toxicity between, say, you took the same active ingredient, it's typically more toxic via an oral route of entry, correct? As opposed right. to a contact toxicity? Right. So, yeah, all insecticides are going to be almost in all cases more active by ingestion than they are by dermal exposure. And, and why is that? Um, well, in terms of the insect, you know, the cuticle, their outer cuticle is. It's it's waterproof and it's got lots of layers, whereas if you look at the gut, you know I showed that picture of the gut. It's just a thin la the gut is a thin layer of cells and stuff, mm -hmm. as opposed to the cuticle. And in mammals, you know, in our skin is an incredibly uh, resistant barrier to insecticides mm -hmm. and toxins. So, just things are always more active by ingestion. Mm -hmm. And the final question here, Mike. Um, 
and this is, I, I think, somewhat of a loaded question. I, the difference between repellent and non-repellent insecticides, I, I don't, I don't know that it's really that simple. Uh, somebody here wants information on where they could go to find insecticides that are repellent and others that are non-repellent. Is that is it that simple? Mm -hmm. um, I th I think probably in the trade magazines. I'm th I'm thinking back to when the non-repellent termiticides first hit the market mm -hmm. 15 years ago. Yeah, there was, there was a lot of talk about that, and I think the real distinction there is pyrethroids and everything else. I see. Pyrethroids are like pepper spray to insects, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and all our other actives are not detected nearly as much. Yeah. I had one final question here, Mike, before we let you go. Uh, so the essential oils seem to have really, you know, the, the whole green revolution here over the past several years has really kind of taken off in terms of uh, use of uh, 25B exempt actives, you know, rosemary and spearmint and cedar, that kind of thing. Right. Can you comment on kind of, have any ideas on why that's happening in terms of, uh, I guess, guess you don't have the registration costs for one thing, but there seems to be a lot of products in that have a lot of those essential oils in them now. Right. Well, and com consumers want them. You know, mm -hmm. the customers are, they have the ability to learn about these things more and, um, you know, there, so there's the demand. I think is what mm -hmm. is probably what it comes down to. Mm -hmm. They they're can really be effective. They're very, yeah, they're good, very good repellents. We've done a lot of work with them on ants. They're very repellent. Right. They smell nice <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> you get aromatherapy in combination with. Yeah. Your house can smell like a peppermint candy. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. I think that's about it, Mike. We really appreciate this. I've 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 seen uh, this is something the industry just doesn't get enough of. It's uh. And you really have put this together nicely. It's from from A to Z here. It's really nice. So we appreciate your time. And uh, thanks, everybody, for paying attention. Again, don't log out. We're going to take a five-minute break now and get ready for ants. And uh, appreciate it, Mike. And we'll, uh, we'll see you in a couple weeks. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Thank yeah, you, everybody. Thanks.